God, we give you glory for the presence that we feel even now. God, we bow before you. God, we say that you are the God of everything. And this morning, God, we've come because we need you. We need your presence, God. We need your power. God, we need you to intervene on our behalf, God, even now. God, and even on this Mother's Day, we are even now keenly aware of those who struggle during this time. Those, God, who do not have their earthly mother here with them. God, we're praying for their strength even now, God, in the name of Jesus. We're praying, God, that you touch. We're praying that you heal. We're praying, God, that you deliver even those, even now, God. We're praying for those, God, who this is their first Mother's Day without their mother being with them. Give them strength now, God, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you touch even now. I pray for those, God, who had a strained relationship with their mother, but their mother left here before they had an opportunity to get it together. Now they're struggling in this time about what they should have done and what they could have done. But we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would heal that hurt because only you can. But ultimately, God, we're just asking you to be God for us. God, we all have needs, various reasons why we have come, various reasons why we are watching, various reasons why we're reaching out to you. And so, Lord, we're simply asking you to touch all of us right where we are in the name of Jesus. God, we can see clearly now. God, this coronavirus has driven some to their knees. And God, now we can see clearer than ever before. Our ears are open, God. Speak, Lord, right now for your servants here. Lord, now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for what you're going to do today. Even in this virtual service, we thank you for every person that will give their life to you today. Every person, God, that will join the kingdom of heaven, every person that will connect with this church, every person that will receive their deliverance and their healing, even now. And we pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will send a word in this time that builds us up, that makes us better. And God, we give you the glory for it even now. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. And amen. We give God glory for his goodness and we say happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers everywhere those who are in the sanctuary and those who are watching even now online we thank God for for you I thank God for Lady Jess uh, for being the wife and mother that she is and I thank God that she's watching she's keeping the babies uh, keeping the babies safe but I thank God for, for her. Uh, I thank God for even my own mother. Amen. I thank Amen. God. And everybody just ought to give a shout out to your mama. Say, hey mama, hey mama, hey mama, hey mama. Yeah. We wouldn't have what we have. We wouldn't have life without our mothers. And so we thank God for them. Amen. And today we're not going to even prolong the time at all. We're just excited for another opportunity to worship uh, with you all and Soon enough, we'll be worshiping together in the sanctuary. Uh, we tried to release a statement from our church. Uh, we heard what the governor said about May 4th and opening up uh, houses of worship to in-person services, but it's just too soon. And we want to make sure that when we come back in the sanctuary, it's safe to do so. Uh, we don't want our sanctuary to be a cesspool uh, for spreading disease and germs. Uh, but when we do come back, we're going to come back with precautions in place. And it won't be very long at all that we're going to be back worshiping together. And I'm just praying and hoping that when we open the doors, uh, that it'll be standing room only. That, that God's message has come through clearly to all of us and that we'll be coming here ready to give God glory. That day, when we all get together, that day, I ain't talking about in heaven. I'm talking about when we come back to the sanctuary. What a day of rejoicing. Uh, that will be and uh, we just thank God for what he's going to do uh, even now 
Uh, if you have your Bibles, and I, and I pray that you do, if you would turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, we're going to begin our reading in verse 16. And we're going to read down through verse 27. 1 Kings chapter 3. Verse 16 through verse 27. And I just want all the mothers to know I must really love y'all for real because I had planned on doing something else. All right. And I was just going to, you know, <laughs> push this off the next week over about 4 o'clock in the morning. Oh, Lord. My God. So, amen. That's all right. But that's how God does it. God don't need a whole lot of time. And uh, he'll speak in the self-same hour if you're listening to him. First Kings chapter 3, verse 16 through 27. When you have it, would you say amen? Amen. Here's what the Bible says. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, Oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day. After that, I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from, my, from beside me while that handmaiden slept. And laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, because it was not my son, which I did bear. And the woman, the other woman said, nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, no, but the dead is thy son and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, the one said, this is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other said, nay, but thy son is dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman who the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child. Yeah. And in no wise slay it. But the other said, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Just trifling. Mm -hmm. Then the king answered and said, give her the living child. And in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Uh, this morning, for the next few moments on this Mother's Day, we're going to tag this text, A Model Mother. A Model Mother. Many of us, if we were to take the time to consider our mothers or the mother figures in our lives, uh, we may all be able to say in unison that our mother was not perfect, but she was ours. And uh, I, try, I say this often, that uh, us daddies don't always get I just do. Uh, because if we were not quarantined today and, and having stay-at-home orders today, uh, if it was Father's Day, we can walk into any restaurant in the city with no problems and no reservations. Oh, but on Mother's Day, <laughs> there was no room in the inn. On Father's Day, we can go to the shelf and we can find a Father's Day card pretty easily. And the shelves will be fully stocked. But on Mother's Day, if you waited until Saturday evening after 7 o'clock, you had to get the scraps. And your card probably didn't say what you wanted to say from your heart, but it's just all they had left. <laughs> it's because there is a certain level of respect and love that goes to mothers that does not fit any other title or any other mold in our lives. And so then when I say the phrase model mother, I'm not speaking of a model in terms of 
uh, Vanity Fair or the cover of Ebony Magazine, although that may be true. But a model mother is not about how she looks, but it's about what she does. And I know the text that I've read into your hearing uh, may not seem as if it gives us the picture of a model mother. But I pray that if you pray with us in the next few moments, and I mean few moments, because we want to, I want to get everybody to their family. Um, I believe we'll be able to show you a picture of a model mother. Now this chapter in 1 Kings uh, is very unique in that this is one of the tests, or it's the first test that King Solomon uses. It's the first time that he shows his level of wisdom as king over Israel. And as an unproven king, there were many who may have had doubts about him and his ability to lead such a great group of people. But he prays to God and he asks God to give him wisdom so that he may have the ability to rule and lead God's people as God would have him to do. And so this text, these verses, verse 16 through 27, is a litmus test that was given to Solomon that he passes with flying colors to show the level of wisdom that he has, but it reveals to us something very unique about a model mother. The first thing that we see in this text is that a model, mo model mother doesn't play about her children. All right, that's point number one. That ought to be real easy. That should fit just about all of us. Write that down somewhere. A model mother doesn't play about her children. Right there in verse number 16. You ain't even got to get out the verse before we see some stuff that ought to catch our attention. The verse says, Then came there two women that were harlots. Now, when we look at that, that should stand out to us because, number one, the text does not tell us who these women are because it does not give their names, but it does tell us what they do. Text says that they are harlots. All right, and that's not a term that we throw around very much in this today's time. But these are women of the night. Is what they are. These are the women who go to work in the places that are shameful when the lights are off and down. These are women who work in the red light district, but they're not cooking hamburgers. Y'all, y'all get what I'm saying. All right. These are harlots. Is what the text says. And the reason that this should stand out about it to you is because these are harlots and the text lets us know that they both have children. But in the culture that they come from, it was not common at all for harlots to have children because it was bad for business. Because in this culture, women were not allowed to work outside of the home. And so she was solely the responsibility of her husband. And if she had a male child and not a husband, then the son would take care of her. And so then there were some women who did not have husbands and who did not have sons who were of age to take care of them. And so this was the profession of some women. It was a very shameful uh, profession. And it was not common for women who were harlots, therefore, to have children. So it was typical for women who were harlots who got pregnant to either abort their child or abandon their child. Stay with me. Yet the text shows us two women who are not only harlots, but they are mothers. Which means that despite their history, they put all of that aside to parent their children. Here are two women who gave up their career, although it not a nice one or a good one or a sanctified career. They gave it up to be mothers to their children. That's because a model mother understands that when you have a child, there's some things that ought to change. They left the lifestyle that they had to pursue a whole new lifestyle because even in the words of that great theologian, Faith Hill, a baby changes everything. <laughs> because when you have some children, there is some stuff you all not want your child to see. A model mother won't let that child see them get out of character in public. They don't care how mad they get. A model mother won't do that. A model mother won't allow 
uh, the child to disrespect their father and they won't disrespect the father in front of the child even if they disagree. A modern mother ain't going to spend more time partying than she's going to spend at parent-teacher conferences. But the women in the text, they make a change because they didn't want their children to see them living in that lifestyle. But there's something else that I want you to see about these women. And we see automatically that these women are not perfect because they are harlots. But being a model mother is not about being a perfect mother. In fact, being a model mother is not about what they do or don't do, but sometimes, here it is, it's about what they gave up to be a good mother to you. Sometimes we look at it and we say, well, my mama didn't provide this, or she didn't provide that, or I wish she wouldn't have done this, or I wish she wouldn't have done that. But if you take the time to think about all of the mothers who gave up their seat at the corporate table to make sure you had food on the dinner table, it's not all about what they do and don't do. Sometimes it's, not, it's about what they gave up for you. And to think about that there are many who now are thinking back in their lives and thinking about their mother and they're regretting not giving their mother the best of them and showing the best of their love because it, take, it has taken this long to get to a place of understanding that it's not about what she gave you but about what she gave up for you. That stands out sometimes more often than not. We look at verse 16. They are harlots, but they are also mothers. But there's a second thing in the text in verse 16 that stands out if you look at the culture of it. The verse says, look at the verse, verse 16. It says that they came unto the king and stood before him. Now, don't run past that because there's a lot in those words right there. Because kings, y'all, did not openly entertain the presence of prostitutes. Because that was against royal protocol. They wanted to make sure that if there was anybody uh -huh, in our modern day uh, vernacular that had a, a, a phone that was recording, they was wanting to make sure the paparazzi didn't get this stuff on Facebook live. So they didn't want the, the temple scribe <laughs> to write down who was seeing the king because you know, some stuff, when you hear that two things are in the same room, you, you ain't going to think the best of it. The king was in the room with who? And no matter who, what you say, or who you are, sometimes it's harder to fix it. Because folks would rather believe a lie than the truth. And so kings did not entertain the presence of prostitutes. It was against protocol. And the type of people who got audience with the king were queens and, and kings of other nations. They were, they were trusted advisors and counselors. They were heads of state. Uh, they were people who had great titles. And we should understand this because uh, we are all Americans. And uh, we cannot, trust me, we cannot just walk up to the White House and go talk to the president, even though I want to talk to him every day. We can't just get up and go jump over the fence and run through the White House lawn to go see the president because you ain't going to make it all the way to the door. <laughs> it's going to be some other stuff that take place before you get there. You're going to see Jesus before you see the president. Uh-huh. And I just wish, every now and then, I just wish I could call him because as much money as he take out of my check, he needs to answer my call. And it's how he driving his country into the ground. He needs somebody to talk to him. But the reality is we can't just walk up to the White House and go talk to the president because there are levels to this. But the text says that here are two harlots, it's in, it's in your Bible, that are standing in the presence of the king of Israel and he's entertaining their conversation. And so the question that I'm going to come from this is how do they pull this off? Who is it that they know how much money have they paid? How do they get past all of the security without a title, without a name that would give them audience with the king of Israel? How do they get in the same room with the king? And so I started searching high and low to try to find some type of Jewish protocol that would have allowed these women into his presence. There had to be something that if this, if this particular thing took place that would allow them the opportunity to come and talk to the king, y'all, I look high and I look low and I couldn't find nothing. Right. And so I'm just wondering, how did they get in the presence 
of the king. And then it dawned on me. Because I had to think about my own situation. They didn't get into the palace to see the king because they followed some protocol. They got in there to see the king because they were parents. Because a model mother would do whatever it takes to resolve an issue concerning her child. And so then, there was no security guard that was going to keep her out of Solomon's face because I have an issue concerning my child and I need you to answer my question. And here's the reality. You can have a child that comes home. I'm talking about modern mothers now. That that child comes home with an issue at school and the teacher sends a letter home and you read that letter and it don't sound right. A modern mother now. They're not just going to sign this note and send it back to school. But tomorrow I'm going to take you to school. Come on here somebody. Because I got to have a conversation with that teacher. And if that don't resolve the issue, I'm going to make a meeting with the principal. And if that don't solve the problem, we're going to go talk to the school board. And if that don't solve the problem, we're going to go talk to the alderman. I'm going to tell Jesus about it. But at the end of the day, a model mother ain't going to stop until she get resolution about her child. But here's what you need to see. The woman in the text pushes past all protocols to get in the presence of the person who can fix their problem. I'm talking about my mothers. They're not going to just go home and just let it go. You can't come, your child can't come out saved, sanctified, and filled with the precious Holy Ghost and that with fire with a mind and determination to run for Jesus. But if your child come home tomorrow and tell you that the teacher pushed them, <laughs> uh-huh, I got a witness even over there in the office. Yeah. <laughs> If they come home and say that that teacher pushed me, <laughs> we're going to need all the oil from all the oil fields in all of the world to make sure that when you go down there, you're going to be, and see, here's the reality. And you're going to go down there, you ain't going to, you may not even comb your hair, you may wear your robe. With no, that's right, just holding that thing together because the whole strap gone. You ain't got time to put on them, you holding it together like this here. House shoes on and that hair ain't even combed because you ain't got time to be fixed up because you got some business to go and handle concerning your child. I'm talking about a model mother. Yeah. But you're going to go and talk. Now, you're not just going to walk in the door and going to go talk to the secretary. No, I don't need to talk to the secretary. I need to talk to that teacher and the principal and whoever else in here has the ability to fix my problem because they're not going to stop at just the door. They're going to keep pushing till they fix the problem. I remember uh, my, my cousin, my aunt uh, Juanita, she was taking care of his son. And everybody was saying that his son had issues, this and all this kind of stuff. And uh, she was teaching preschool. And so then they were talking about he need to be on this medicine and he need to do this, need to do that. She said, no, that ain't what he need. She said, I just need to spend some time with him. And when everybody wanted to medicate him, she said, no, nah, I'm going to spend some time with him. And so she would sit down with him. She would go through all of his homework. She would teach him the stuff that she felt like the teacher was missing. I'm talking about a mama mother. And as a grandmama, that boy, by the time she got done with him, was making A's and B's in school, sitting in his chair, paying attention to what the teacher was saying, simply because she took the time to spend time. Now that's foreign to some of us because the TV is raising some of our children. We sit them in front of the TV so we can talk on the phone and we let the, the oldest one watch all the rest of them so we can go out with our friends. But a modern mother is going to spend time with her children because she's going to make sure she takes care of her child. Because that's what model mothers do. They don't play about their children even now. When we have stuff at the church, <laughs> I almost want to send home consent forms with the parents. Because all it takes, now this is the house of the Lord, and, and the Holy Ghost live here. Uh huh. But if that child go home with the wrong report of how it went down at the church, uh huh, 
Some folks ain't going to act all that holy and sanctified. And that don't mean that you're crazy. It just means that you're a real mama and you feel for your children and you're going to take care of issues concerning your child. So a modern mother, they don't play about their children. But secondly, modern mothers are particular about their choices. Go down to verse number 19. Look what it says. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. Now, the woman who's talking is the mother whose child is alive because she don't want this other woman speaking for her. I don't need you talking for my child. You're the one who got all this stirred up in the first place. So you just hush and let me talk to the man because this is my child we talking about right here. And it just reminded me Lord have mercy on my wife. Uh-huh. Because sometimes it, there was an issue in a particular situation that we had to go to the school. And I'm going to try to go in there. Yeah, and I'm just, don't just be, let me do all of the talking. I thought that's what was the plan when we was in the car. Yeah. But by the time we got in there, <laughs> and that teacher, the stuff they were saying wasn't matching up <laughs> to what she felt in her spirit. And so she threw all of them protocols away. And she said, listen now, you, listen here. I, this is what I'm about to tell you. And by the time that it just got through talking, that woman had opened up the whole book of life and told all of the truth. And everything that happened, and, everything, and I'm so sorry, whatever you need. And, we was, and, and my child had some of the best situations for the rest of the year. Because she knew if you violate, there is one. That's coming down here, and she's gonna come find you. And you will have to explain everything that you got to say. And so the woman in the text that's talking in verse 19, this is her child that's alive, and she says, No, I'm gonna talk for my child. She said, We both had babies. And she said, I'm gonna tell you how I know uh, what's going on here. She sounds like a sister to me. She said, I'm gonna tell you how I know because they're the best investigators. If you ever want to find out. Anything, listen, some of them, they miss their callings private eyes. They're going to they gonna put all of the stuff together, dot all the eyes and cross all of the teeth. She said, I'm going to tell you how I know what happened here. She says, we both had babies, and I had mine three days before hers. Now, them, 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 <laughs> them details, for us, we like, they don't even matter. She had a baby, and this would happen. No, no, this was a sister talking. She says, I had my baby three days before her baby. She says, and her baby died because she laid on the baby. And then she took the baby and put her dead baby in my bosom and took my baby. And so the question I was thinking about, if you were asleep, how you know she laid on her baby? Because I'm telling you now, sisters, our mothers, they are investigators. You can come in the room and something got broke. And when she walked in the room, she already know who broke it. So when she asks questions, it's for you to verify what she already know. I used to just wonder, how in the world does she know it's like the Holy Ghost would just tell us something ain't right, and I walk in the house. How was your day in school? And I'm like, I know that teacher called us. She had to call her. But she just had the Holy Ghost. It's something about a mother's intuition. Even though she was asleep, she said, I know exactly how your baby died. It was at midnight when you brought the baby over here. I was asleep, but I know what happened when you did it. That's just a mother's intuition. She sounds like one of our mothers. And she says, and then she said, and this woman's child died because she laid on it. Now this immediately caught my attention not because, just because the child died, but it's how the child died. Stay with me. Verse says that her child died in the night because she laid on it. And the implication here is not that she smushed it. I like that word. But she smothered it. Uh-huh. Okay. Here's the implication. She, she didn't smush her baby because to smush it is just to crush it. You just roll over and splat that in. No, that, it, it, she didn't smush her baby. She smothered her baby. Which means that she rolled over on her child and got comfortable and that smothered her child to death. I hope we're we going to just stay with me. Stay with me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now I can remember here's what brought it to light for me. I remember when Mackenzie was first born and uh, we were brand new parents, so we got smart now. We don't let, we don't let Riley sleep in the bed with us, right? Because we learned after the first baby. Don't let the baby sleep in the bed with you all night because then later on they don't want to get out the bed even, yeah. 
it don't matter if you in the bed or not. Yeah. You know, well, anyway, we, yeah, we on, yeah. We on live, all right. Married ministry, we'll talk about this later. All right. And so now, then, I'm preaching to somebody right now. <laughs> and so I learned, uh -huh, after the first one, put that baby in the crib. And if she cries, she won't surely die. But in the first one, now, you know, she would lay in the bed with us. And I remember Lady Jess would get up in the morning and she'd be so stiff because she lay in an uncomfortable position all night because she knew the baby was in the bed and she was not going to harm her child. She wanted to make sure Mackenzie was safe. And so she lay all night. I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. In an uncomfortable position to make sure that Mackenzie was safe. And so then, the question that came to mind for me is that in order for this mother to lay on her child and smother her baby is an indication, number one, that she didn't know where her baby was in the bed. All right, all right. All right stay with me. We're going somewhere. So the question is, as a mother, how does she not know where her child is? Uh huh. How does she not know where her child is? And I don't have to go far. I don't have to go all the way back in the Bible to find this because I remember just last year at the state fair. Me and my family were walking through the state fair and I saw this woman cussing her children out, just cussing them out at the, at the gate, at the door. Just cussing her kids out. And I said, She ain't got to talk to them babies. Like, because one of the babies was no more than five or six. You ain't got to talk to them kids like that. And she just let her have it. I said, Now this don't make sense. But later on, while we're walking through the fair, I see the same little girl walking by herself, crying. Five or six years old, her mama is nowhere to be found. We in the state fair, and it's only it's so packed in the fair that you can barely move in there. And here's a five-year-old little girl walking through the fair, crying, and her mother was nowhere to be found. And before I could get to the little girl, it was another concerned mother, because she was a model mother. Come on, somebody. That saw that child crying, walked to that child and said, where is your mama? She said, I don't know where she is. I hadn't seen her since such and such time. And she got the child, picked the child up, y'all. It wasn't even her baby. They weren't even the same color. Picked the child up because motherly instincts are stronger even than race. I want y'all to hear me, somebody. And she picked up the child and consoled this child as a mother, took her to the police and said, we got to find her mama. This child is lost. And what was amazing about it is when she asked the officer, had there been any reports of a missing child? He said no. Wow. So from all of the time that this child was lost in Little Rock at the state fair, her mama never even recognized that she was gone. Wow. And so then, I don't have to go all the way back to see mothers who don't even know what their children are. Wow. It's amazing when you can walk through the store and see children just walking by themselves. Uh -huh. Go down the street and see a child that shouldn't even be outside walking up to the street. And you wonder, where is your mother? And the reality is that child predators play on children whose parents are not paying attention. Uh -huh. They look for the ones who are so preoccupied with something else that they don't know where their children are. And then whenever the child come up missing, now we're all on Facebook, all on CD crying, uh -huh. and wonder what's going on. I saw a mother uh, a couple of years ago she was on Facebook. It just made me mad, y'all. Be angry, but sitting down. I got angry at that one. And she's sitting on there. She just crying. She's just losing her mind. And when they asked her, when was the last time you saw your child? She said, I let her out of the car to go to the playground. I stayed on behind because I was on the phone. Then when she went to the playground, she never looked for her child to verify where she was. And it was not until she was almost ready to go that she started calling her child's name. Which means that whoever snatched her baby could have snatched it at any time. She couldn't even give the police officers a timeline of when she came up missing because she did not know where her child was. All right, all right. But a model mother, can I tell you, because I keep saying Lady Jess because I know, uh-huh. A model mother, <laughs> whenever we come anywhere, I don't care if it's 6,000 people in here. She's going to know exactly where her children are. She'll leave them with somebody she trusts. And here's the reality. If she come back to where she left them, and they not there, Lord have mercy. 
somebody got some questions to answer. Because a modern mother always knows where their children are. I remember when we used to go to the store with my grandma, we got store instructions. Stand right here. Put your hand on this cart and don't ask for nothing. Come on here, somebody. Y'all know my grandma. Don't ask for nothing. <laughs> and don't get out of my sight. And if by chance, listen, y'all, I don't care if a tornado would have torn the roof off of County Market. I'm going to be, you're going to find me stuck to this basket wherever the wind takes us because I'm not letting go. <laughs> Please say, hold to this hand, God's unchanged. I'm going to hold to this basket, cause <laughs> If I don't want to see Jesus this evening, yeah, I need to hold on with all I got. I just believe, I just believe my grandma taught me how to hold on to the Lord. <laughs> how I held on to that basket. No matter what happens, I don't care. What distractions came around, I'm going to keep holding. I don't care who called my I'm going to keep holding. And it's a reality. It could have been somebody from the church that called my name in the store. But it, what, here's what I'm telling you. I'm away with this hand. And hold with this one. <laughs> They're talking about surviving of the fittest now. It went, and I wasn't holding on so nobody wouldn't take me. I was holding on. So my grandmama, uh -huh, when we got home, yeah, didn't destroy me. But I learned to hold on, y'all. But here's the second thing I see in the text. First thing is, she don't see, she don't know where her child is. But the second question I have is, as a mother, how could she have laid on her child and not feel it? Okay, stay with me. We That's because there are some mothers who do not have motherly instincts. And as a result, they don't feel how they should feel concerning their children. Don't miss this. She rolled over in the bed, trying to get comfortable, and smothered her baby. Which says, y'all, that she preferred her own comfort over her child's safety. I'm talking to somebody in here who don't care about your children by the way you act. Here's the reality. She's trying to get comfortable in the bed and you done got that comfortable that you roll over on your child and not smush it but smother it and never felt your child. But that's how you can have a mother who can hear their child tell them that your live-in boyfriend touched me in the wrong place. And she get mad at the baby instead of the boyfriend is because you ain't got the right motherly instincts. Because a real mama, uh huh, ain't gonna be no us until we figure out this. Uh huh, it's gonna be some smoke in the city, some problems if my child says, Listen here, you can whoop the child later if you're not telling the truth, but right now, motherly instincts are you got some questions. Let's handle this right now. It's gonna be, yeah, yeah, come on in there, come on in the room. We got something to talk about. And, and my wife told me about this story. There was a, a young lady on Facebook, and I think she did it on Facebook Live, but she recorded herself because she said that her, her mother's boyfriend had touched her inappropriately, and he would do it every time she would leave. And so then, she said, I don't believe my mama would believe me. So she got on Facebook Live to tell her mama what happened and put the phone where her mama couldn't see it. And then went live and started telling her mama what happened. She said, Mom, I got something to tell you. And her mom said, what you got to tell me? What you got to say? She said, I got to tell you something. Told her about the boyfriend name. What about him? She said, well, when you're not here, you know, she told her the whole story. Oh, oh is, that, is that correct? Is that right? Is that right? You don't never, and this is what the mama said to the child. You don't want me to be happy. You trying to mess this up for me. That's a good man. He paid all of my bills. And you trying to mess up his reputation with them lies. She was more concerned about her own comfort than her child's safety. And it's my opinion that folks like that, you ought not have no child. You ought not have no, but you ought to have to pay a, a fine, a tax. <laughs> Every time you do something crazy, you ought to have to pay for it. Because maybe you care about your money more than you care about your child. So now, it just makes you wonder about what some children go through because all children don't have model. Mothers. 
But a mother's, a model mother's first instinct is to protect her child. And there's nothing more important than her child. See, I had to learn. I had to be taught, uh, watching my wife, how serious I had to be about my children. Now the roles have switched a little bit because now I'm always overly concerned. I'm losing my mind about all the little stuff, and now she's all right. Because she knows the difference between every cry. All of them sound the same to me. All of the cries I hear are, a lion is eating me currently. Come now. That's what I hear. And she listened to the cries and all that. No, she just, she just, she just wet. <laughs> How you hear that? <laughs> I know. Lord have mercy. She knows the difference between she wet, she mad, she frustrated, or she hurt for real. And her movements are different based on the tonality of the cries. Because a model mother, Lord have mercy, knows her child. Which makes me wonder, how did this woman think that you was going to take a child that this woman didn't birth and switch it and she wouldn't know? Because a real mama know her child from afar off. She can see, that's my, you ain't got to be close. You can see the walk and say, yeah, that's my son right there. I, you go to the graduation, we didn't get there in time. We way up in the nosebleeds. And this woman, that's, that's him right there. They all got on the same thing. All of them looked the same height from up here. But when she looked all the way from up there, way down there, she said, that's my child. I hope y'all hearing me what I'm saying. Because he sits high. Yeah, Lord, have mercy. And he looks low. And even if you feel like God can't see you, he can look from way up in glory down on his head and say, that's my child right there. Yeah. That's my child in whom I'm well, well pleased. Uh-huh. Because a real mama, yeah, cares about her child's safety. So a model mother doesn't play about her children. <laughs> they are particular about their choices. But here's the last part. Model mothers always prefer their children. So go down to verse 24. I'm almost finished. Made a good time today. Go down to verse 24. It says, and the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. Now, I'm, I told y'all, me and my wife, we're going to switch roles now. So now I'm the one who always overly, you know, messed up about stuff. Because when they said, bring me a sword, the first thing that came to mind is when we take the girls to get shots. It seemed like that thing they bring out is a sword. <laughs> That thing is, and I'm sitting here, I'm sweating. Just, just, she just as calm as ever. She just says, everything is going to be all right. I'm like, now what they going to do with that? Now they're going to do that today. <laughs> now they can check her temperature. Uh-huh, they can do everything other than. But they're not sticking up with that. So that's why when she go give a shot, y'all, y'all just keep praying for me. When they give, give a shot, I can't go. I have to stay on. <laughs> I got to go do something else. But they said, bring me a sword. That's what Solomon says. They brought the sword before the king, and the king said, divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Now, here's what Solomon's doing. This is where Solomon proves that he has the wisdom to lead Israel. Because Solomon says, here's how we're going to determine who the real mother is. I'm going to create a test of motherhood. Solomon says, I know both of y'all want him, but I want to know, do you want him at the expense of what's best for him? I hope you hear what I'm saying. I know both of y'all want him. I know both of y'all want him. He says, so I'll give you what you want, but he's going to have to die in the process. I hope you hear what I'm saying. And so here's the text, he says. He bring, they bring the child. He says, I'm going to cut this child in half. Give you half and give you half. And the real mama, it says for her bowels yearn for her son. Because when a real mama, when they connect to the child, it ain't just about what's going on up here. It's about what's going on down in here. A real mama, y'all, can let her child, if her child fall in a, in a, lion, a lion pit, she'll go in there after. You better grab her. Because she'll go in there after. You're not going to just eat my child. You're going to have to eat us. Uh-huh, because I'm not letting my child go. A real mama will run in front of a moving car to save her child. 
I'm telling a real mama will run in a burning building if her child is in there. And so the real mama, the text says, has a because of the yearning in her bowels and saying, Oh my Lord, give her the living child and in no way slay it. But here's the other woman who ain't got no motherly instincts. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Now here's my concern. Because if Solomon would have given this other mother the child, you've already proven you don't have no motherly instincts because you laid on your own child. But now you've proven that you really don't even care about this child anyway because you're willing to kill the child for what you want. So what happens to this child if he puts this child in your care? It makes me wonder sometimes how we see blended families come together. And sometimes you have a mother just because these ain't my kids. They don't care about the welfare or the well-being of the child. You ain't my child. You ain't my son. You ain't my daughter. But a real mother, Lord have mercy, just because this is a precious child, I'm going to treat this child as my own. Now here's why I didn't necessarily like that all the way when I was a child. Because my grandmama believed that there were some folks <laughs> Who didn't have to spare the rod like she did. And so with some folks, my grandma would let them tear me up if I acted up where they were. And my grandma's philosophy was this. If I can't whoop your child, they can come to my house. <laughs> if I can't whoop them, that's right, I can't keep up. <laughs> if I can't beat them, you need to get another babysitter. Because <laughs> if they tear up some over here... <laughs> If I tell them to go sit down and they don't go sit down, I'm going to help them just like my own. And it was not abuse. It was simply that they mothered their children the same way that they mothered their, somebody else's children the same way they mothered their own. So here's the test that Solomon gives. He says, I can give you what you want, but are you willing to sacrifice what you want for what's best for your child? And that's the test. Are you willing to give up what you want for what's best for your child? It just makes me prayerful and makes me hurt for children who are in abusive relationships. And because you have a mother who may not want to be single, she's allowing her child to be exposed to a predator. This makes me wonder and pray for those who are struggling even now because they wish that they had another opportunity to tell their mother things that they never said to them but they didn't tell her because they didn't think she would believe them. But then I'm so optimistic about mothers that when they hear there's an issue with their child they're going to come running. And today even on this Mother's Day I feel in my spirit that there is an opportunity for some mothers to reconnect to some children. Even though your mother may not have been a perfect mother, it's not all about what she gave you, but what she gave up for you. Here's what I had to learn. In most cases, people do the best they can. So even though, I mean, I wish I would have had this and I wish I would have had that. And I look back on my life to see the lessons then my grandma talked. Sometimes I would listen to what she was saying. Like, that's old, foggy stuff. She don't know. You raised, raised kids in the 30s. That don't even make sense. But now that I'm in my 30s, All right, I remember stuff that she would say to me and said, if I didn't have that wisdom, sometimes I feel like an old man <laughs> and a young man body. Because I remember the stuff my grandma was saying. <laughs> my grandma would say to me, like an old man and a young man's body. But it made me so appreciative Amen. That's right. That's right. because she was a model mother. Amen. And here's the reality. Your mother or the person who mother you don't even have to be your biological mother. But today is the day to appreciate anybody who's mothered you and stood in the gap, nurtured you, prayed for you, cared for you, looked out for you. Today is their day.